Hello everybody. I recently delivered a talk on the validation of hyperpigmented patches on the face at the Dermacon International meeting in Mumbai in February 2023. I thought I'll uh, share the presentation that I delivered there for those of you who may want to listen. So the outline of my presentation is basically I'm going to discuss various entities that may present with hyperpigmentation seek, followed by an algorithm for evaluation and management. I first am going to start off with three tricky cases. The tricky for uh, people who have not seen this entity, but easy once you know. So this is a 28 year old female who, is, who presented with hypopigmented macules on the face, as you can see here, just around the eyebrows and some hypopigmentary on the side of the nose, patches here, 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 around the ears. And also she had a hypopigmented patch behind the ear and also some patches on the elbow. What is the diagnosis? If you've seen this, you know it. This is another similar patient who presented with a bit more diffuse, uh, but uh, sort of spotted um, salty type of pigmentation. You see small spots here, diffusely all over the face, no other involvement anywhere of the body. Okay. Now these uh, are typical examples of pityriasis versicolor. If you do a biopsy, you're going to see these yeast forms in the stratum conium, which often don't even need a PA stain to diagnose them. What about this chap? This is a young boy, about 11, 12 years old, who presented with these guttate hyperpigmented vacuoles on the face and some extending onto the neck. Now, again, um, this is easy to diagnose if you know where it is. If you do a dermoscopy, what you may see is these inconspicuous uh, skin ridges and furrows on and the places where you have these sort of guttate macules. This again is an example of pituitary versicular, a common cause of hyperpigmentation on the face. The clues are the spontaneous waxing and waning. The patient will give a long history, she may say, or he may say they've had this problem many years ago. It keeps coming every summer or every 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 uh, so often. Asymptomatic but mild itching or burning may be present on the sweating. That is a clue again to the diagnosis may have a history of topical steroid abuse, especially if they're females uh, who are in the 20s or you know, late teens. Irregular borders, satellite lesions, lesions along flexures and eyebrows often are the clue. What about this patient? This patient presented with hyperpigmented macules on the face, slightly raised in the surface, and then you have this clue and this clue here on the neck. This is Cobner's phenomenon. This is a case of Veruca plana. If you do a biopsy, you see these nice coelocytes, which give you the diagnosis, okay? So, verruca plana, a common, uh, not, a, not a common, but uncommon cause of hyperpigmentation in the face, but can catch you out if you're in a hurry and don't look at the slight elevation of these uh, macules and the Cobner's phenomenon. Don't be a rush, in a rush to make a diagnosis of pituitous versicolor. Now, this is an unusual uh, presentation. You often so don't see this disease so early. This is a patient with unilateral hyperpigmented macules of two weeks duration. If you've seen enough of these cases, you know that this is a segmented pattern and this is early monosegmented vitiligo. This is a patient we uh, published as part of our um, study on vitiligo. In fact, in the early phase when you do a biopsy in this particular patient, you see this sort of uh, vacular interface change which we've described in our papers on vitiligo. You can see here the clear demarcation between the pigmented and the depigmented skin or the hyperpigmented skin in this case. Remember, once you start treating the patient, the disease will evolve. So despite treatment, the pigmentation first uh, goes away, the regions become depigmented from hyperpigmented and then with subsequent treatment, uh, you develop repigmentation. Okay, but this is an example of a, well, this is, the, this is what you may see if you biopsy the patient at this stage. And most cases of vitiligo in literature have been biopsied at this phase and, and vitiligo uh, histopathology has been reported as being non-specific because what you see in this post-inflammatory phase is loss of rate ridges, disarrayed basement membrane zone, uh, zone and perivascular infiltrate of lymphocytes which is non-specific and you may see some melanophages. Histology is non-specific but then you biopsy um, the wrong, uh, biopsy the lesion at the wrong time. If you biopsy the lesion in the early phase, you would catch out the inflammation. Okay. All right. 
Now, um, yeah, if you want to read the uh, papers on with li like on information with LIGO, feel free. These are the references, and then you've got a whole load of other studies on um, uh, with LIGO and, and in fact even lichen sclerosis. There is an entity called vitiligoid lichen sclerosis, which we reappraised, which I've not referenced yet. Feel free to have a read. Now, this is a 12 year old female with a dry patch in the cheeks in six months. Often these lesions last for a few months and go away, and we don't often biopsy them. But this patient, uh, the parents are worried, and therefore we did do a biopsy. And if you do do a biopsy in these cases, this is the typical finding where you see a spongiotic dermatitis. You may see extravasation of RBC, as you're seeing here. This is a high power view showing the spongiotic, uh, you know, almost microvesical formation. This is a typical histology of pityriasis simplex or pityriasis alba, as you would call it. Uh, round, oval, irregular shaped lesions, well demarcated or poorly defined, can be anything. Itch is minimal or absent, usually present on um, the cheeks. Usually, patients have an atopic history. You may think that pityriasis alba in children is, is easy to diagnose, um, but then I'll show you an unusual case later on. But first, this is an 18 year old female with pigmentation on the mounds of three years. So she had this hyperpigmentation all around the mouth. This is from lip licking. So she had lip licking dermatitis with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but recently developed a hypopigmented patch within it. If you don't take the history, you lose out because this patient was using skin shine, which is a basically a triple combination of hydroquinone, tretinoin, and steroid. And this is steroid-induced hypopigmentation. All right. The problem was solved with topical is like acid, um, which I applied, asked her to apply on the entire area, and along with tacrolimus actually on the hyperpigmented patch, and also metvinol with tretinoin on the hyperpigmented patch, along with sunscreen and moisturizer. The patient was happy within a couple of months. So, some cases are not possible to characterize exactly, and this is such a patient. On first instance, you may think that this young boy has a small patch of pituriasis alba on the cheek which he may well have, and uh, the clue to the atopic uh, tendency of the patient is these hyperpigmented patches which you often find in flexures, um, skin folds in these patients often due to sweating or uh, due to milk often or food trickling down and the, patient's not, uh, the, the parents not cleaning it properly. Uh, sometimes you can have food residue accumulating or milk accumulating causing these post-inflammatory uh, post hyperpigmentation from um, simple maceration sometimes. But then, the same patient, look at this. Can you see this sort of geometrical, well demarcated patch of hyperpigmentation extending from, so the, we had this patch of pituitous alba here, hyperpigmented patches on the skin folds, and then extending on from here was this very well demarcated hyperpigmented patch. Is this segmental pituitous alba, vitiligo, nevus de pigmentosis? Honestly, I don't know because this patient's cleared, uh, all the lesions cleared up within two months of treatment, which I had given, which included a combination of tacrolimus, um, steroid, uh, sorry, uh, sunscreen and moisturizer. I didn't treat this patient with steroids because there was no inflammation, either clinically or symptomatically. This is a 19 year old female who presented with three month history of periolfacial, which includes the eyebrows, you can see here, Symmetrical hyperpigmentation, but look at this exactly symmetrical hyperpigmentation on the nose. Often this perfect symmetry is only found in wet LIGO, but this is a hypo rather than depigmented patch. Um, I think uh, seborrheic dermatitis, especially in adults, can present like this. Uh, often peri uh, sort of involvement of the nasal groove, LR groove, is, is quite characteristic of seborrheic dermatitis, and I think this is an extension of that. Again, because I, I suspected severe dermatitis, I had given itraconazole orally for about two weeks in addition to topical tacrolimus, steroid moisturizer, and the patient cleared up. Okay, so it doesn't matter what we call them, is the question that I'm going to pose. Most of these cases do clear up, um, and I don't think it matters what we call them. Most childhood and even adult cases respond to moisturizer, sunscreen, and tacrolimus, whether we call them early with LIGO, pituitous valve, or whatever you want. Therefore, differentiation probably doesn't matter. If the lesions do not respond in time, the exact diagnosis would be apparent anyway. All right. So data, you may call them whatever you want. All right. But you definitely need a biopsy uh, in some cases. And what are they? This is a 24-year-old 24 24 year female with progressive vitiligoid patch in the chin, 
with my data fee, you can make out the data fee even in the picture. And the bar actually shows some papillary dermal sclerosis, normal epidermis. You can see the dermal sclerosis on low power and as well as higher power. And if you look lower down in the fat, you can see she's got um, this inflammation within the septum, uh, which appears a bit thickened. Collagen appears thickened, lots of lymphocytes here. This, is, this was diagnosed as morphia like in sclerosis overlap. Okay, so this is a case you definitely would benefit from a biopsy. This is from the internet, not my case. Uh, published in the Archives of Dermatology in 2005. 12 year old boy with a one month history of multiple slightly periodic erythematous patch in the face. You can make out that they're actually plaques because they look slightly elevated even of this picture. And the authors um, demonstrate this uh, spongiotic uh, change within the follicular units. You can see here some mild perifollicular inflammation and you can see marked dilatation of the inf uh, follicular units um, with spongiotic material. This is actually blue mucin. This is the case of follicular mucinosis. Okay, you can see the inflammation here uh, in the surrounding uh, in the adjacent hair follicle. Now this is a tricky case. Uh, seen mainly, it's a dilemma mainly in the Indian population. This is a 24 year old female who presented with erythematous hyperpigment patches over the face, hands and legs with reduced sensation since two years. She was in fact treated with MDT multi, uh, with, for leprosy for one year and she stopped that six months ago. There was no obvious progression but the patient was experiencing redness of sun exposure and hence she was worried. She wanted to a biopsy to rule out uh, Hansen's which was recurrent. I didn't think so uh, because the patches were stable for many uh, months. I thought clinical this was post-inflammatory rosacea like sensitivity. Now biopsy was on, on low power unremarkable, the epidermis unremarkable, but you can see some scattered perivascular and periappendigial infiltrates lower down. And you can see this nice perivascular lymphocytic infiltrates with a couple of histiocytes. The inflammation was even extending within the nerve twig. And you can see uh, periacrine infiltrates as well. All of these typical Hansen's disease. Having said that, if you've seen enough of treated Hansen's, treated Hansen's, even for up to two years in studies, has been demonstrated to show mild um, perivascular, uh, perineural and periappendigital infiltrates. This does not imply active disease. So I basically treated this patient as having rosacea-like sensitivity post Hansen's. I did not opt for any further treatment. This is an interesting case referred by one of the local dermatologists, Dr. Farzana. This patient apparently presented with, a, with, a, with deep vitiligoi depigmented macules of the feet and neck with depigmented plaques on the face. You can see that these, these are slightly scaly and indurated even in the picture. This is more like a patch rather than a plaque, but then you can see a nice vitiligoid patch in the neck and these depigmented patches on the feet, symmetrical distribution. Histology from the face shows a marked lichenoid infiltrate. You can see sawtoothing of red ridges even at this bar, mild hypergranulosis, mild follicular plugging, but nothing really in the way of, you can see colloid bodies as well, typical lichen planus like histology. The differential is discoid lupus erythematosus, but there is there are no deeper infiltrates. There is no um, base membrane thickening, which often is present. And uh, yeah, serology in this patient, I believe, was negative. We have in fact described DLE-like changes and chronically photoexposed vitiligo patches. And I don't really know if this is what this patient has. In fact, in this publication in the online dermatology uh, dermatology online journal. We describe a patient who later on developed keratoacanthoma centrifugal, centrifugal marginate in one of the DLE-like patches. This is a 26-year-old female with psoriasis-form hyperpigmented plaques on the trunk, which you can see here, and also psoriasis-like plaques and thin mac, uh, sort of uh, thin plaques and macules on the face. This is interesting, and this is a differential that you need to think about. You expect psoriasis on the biopsy, but what you're seeing is this diffuse vacular interface change with some parakeratosis and some epidermal thinning as well. This is a case of parapsoriasis for a lack of a better name. 
it's not really quite there to call it mycosis fungoides. The term parasoriasis though is not preferred nowadays. The patient does not have features adequate enough or uh, intense enough to be labeled as mycosis fungoides. I would still prefer the term parasoriasis because this allows us to be vague enough and not alarm the patient that this is a malignant entity and most cases they may not turn out to be or did not develop into mycosis fungoides anyway so I don't see any reason to scare the patient away. Now this is probably the most common cause of hyperpigmentation of the face in adults especially in this part of the world and these are four related cases. This is a patient who presented with hyperpigmented patches on cheek, cheeks, both cheeks, which progressively worsened after being treated for vitiligo with topical steroids and phototherapy one of the, by one of the other clinicians uh, in the region. And in fact, you can note the steroid-induced acne from this topical steroid use. What does histology show? Histology shows on low power itself, shows a perifollicular infiltrate, but also um, Papillodermal infiltrate of lymphocytes causing macular interface change with parakeratosis. You can see that here. All right, you can make out the macular interface change, mild spongiosis, parakeratosis. Similar, similarly, in the case, this is a young boy about 12 years old who presented with these depigmented macules on the, on the face. You can make out the slightly violaceous hue. He also had a lesion on his forearm. Again, histology is similar, not very different. This is a chap who presented with these macules in the face again. Histology is much more remarkable with a much more denser infiltrate, some epidermal thinning as well, macular interface change, extravasation of RBCs, spongiosis. You may think this is pterosis like Rodis chronica for, uh, for all you know. But then you see this elongation of retinitis. So it's basically a combination of spongiotic and macular interface dermatitis. Look at this 40 year old male. In fact, I suspected tuberculoid Hansen's here because he was complaining of hyperesthesia. And I thought he also had mild ulnar nerve thickening. Of course, this can be subjective in some, in some patients. Histology again, similar, less intense changes, but similar. Okay, you can see extravasation from RBC as well, though the spongiotic component is less. No features of Hansen's. This is, in fact, vitiligoid PLE vitiligoid polymorphic light eruption, most of these patients, in fact all of these patients, sorry, respond to a combination of tacrolimus, sunscreen, photoprotection and moisturizer within about four to six weeks they clear. Okay, in this particular patient, the last patient, this was masquerading as tuberculoid Hansen's, but this is a very common entity that we see here in India, especially in the southern part of India. Now some cases puzzle you. This patient presented with uh, what he thought were hyperpigmented patches on the face. But then you're seeing this, if you look close enough, you're seeing this hyperpigmentation. And you're thinking, well, is that normal skin? And is this depigmented? Or is this normal skin? And does he have melasma? If you look from the side on view, it's typical these are melasma like patches. Okay, this is normal skin, this is melasma. Normal skin, melasma. And then he has a halo nevus, which is a giveaway. Okay. So halo nevus is another cause of hyperpigmented patches of the skin, but then even in melasma, you may confuse the, the normal skin for hyperpigmented patches. So be careful. Uh, this can occur even in skin types 1 and 2. It's not exclusive to skin, skin types 4 and 5. Even in skin types 1 and 2, you may have this dilemma. Some spotters which are easy to diagnose, uh, the patient themselves will give you the answer, post abrasion, vitiligoid depigmentation, this is post laser, this patient had an NDR laser for nevus abota and developed post inflammatory hyperpigmentation which has taken many months to resolve. Then this is from the internet, this looks like a splash of paint, typical appearance of nevus depigmentosis, uh, irregular well defined borders resembling um, an Splash of paint because they extend around the edges. Um, would go into it deeply. Now this is uh, again a case from the internet, not my own. But the clue here is dioscopy will cause the lesion border to blend with the normal surrounding skin, and this is a case of nevus anemicus or a pharmacological nevus caused by increased sensitivity of blood vessels to catecholamines. Okay, uh, maybe associated with other genetic syndromes. This is from the internet again, hypomelanus of ITO, typical world appearance. Well, this is an interesting case I had. 
I did not actually get the, uh, I did not do any further studies to get give you the exact answer, but this could be one of two diagnoses. You can see these oval hyperpigmented patches on this face. Um, I call these uh, nevus depigmentosis, but then I think that these could also be ash leaf macules because this patient had this verrucous uh, or slightly raised, not really verrucous yet, slightly raised skin colored, you know, erythematous small papules coalescing into a plaque. This could be either an epidermal nevus or a collagenoma. If it's a collagenoma, then you may think of tuberous sclerosis. This patient did not have any other symptoms of tuberous sclerosis, so I haven't yet investigated him any further um, because it's, it would be largely academic. Uh, he doesn't have any other symptoms or, or to suggest a syndrome. Um, so I haven't yet investigated him to give you the exact diagnosis, but then this ash leaf macules and nebus depigmentosus are causes for hyperpigmented patches on the face. Uh, unusual rare cause of pigmentation, this patient had vitiligoid depigmentation after he used to do shaving cream, post-inflammatory vitiligoid depigmentation. This patient has got lichen planus pig uh, pigmentosis with post, and you can see the dermoscopic picture, with post-inflammatory hypopigmentation in some places, uh, some places, um, but on a background of lichen planus pigmentosis. So, in children, the most common causes in my setting anywhere, vitreous alba, vitiligo and PLE. Segmented presentation is not uncommon, remember, maybe in vitiligo predisposed individuals, I don't know. And vitiligo masquerade as vitreous alba, follow up in atypical cases recommended. But most cases of focal childhood vitiligo and even respond to excellent treatment. So uh, some cases you may not know the answer, just treat them, it doesn't matter. Okay, moisturizer, tackle, and sunscreen are pretty good in most cases. In adults, the most common cause in my setting are pituacid vesicular and vitiligoid PLE. Do not forget to ask for topical steroid usage. Examine the trunk and genital for, genitals for clues for either seborrheic dermatitis or in fact tenia, vesicula, tenia fasciae which can uh, uh, sometimes present with hypopigmented patches depending on the color of the lesions. The most practical way to manage even adult cases is symptomatically treating them with moisturizer, tackle and sunscreen. But if they have itching, it warrants treatment, treatment with topical steroids plus minus oral uh, antifungal agents to counter the seborrheic dermatitis component. Okay. Investigations, KOH is the easiest investigation to perform in doubtful cases. Woods lamp, I believe is overrated. I don't usually use it, but if you do, and you, you do find a fluorescence, uh, which is blue white, you may think about red LIGO. If it's yellowish green, think about pituacid vesicular. I would rather just do a KOH if I'm in doubt. Biopsy, certainly there are indications as I explained earlier. Um, unresponsive case of pituacid alba. Clinical symptoms of uh, erythema, itching, scaling, or signs of atrophy, induration, or dispigmentation, or if you're suspecting any of these diseases. Thank you very much.